the cloud, share my screen. There you go, Patrick. All right, great, thank you. I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, this is the January 16th, 2024 meeting of the Ad Hoc Community Center Committee uh, for Scarborough. It is uh, 7.02 and we have five committee members in attendance. And then we have, it looks like, uh, what, three others who are kind of, what do they, what do we call them? I don't know what we call them. Hangers on. <laughs> um, but helping out um, so you know library rep council rep the liaisons there we go Li <laughs> liaisons thank you Jean Marie it's uh it's been a long enough day um so uh I think we have uh, and then we have a uh, our, our consultants on as well from UTL so we have uh minutes from November 9th which we have to approve because we didn't have a quorum at that December meeting to approve the minutes and then we also have the November 20th um minutes uh so i will entertain a motion to approve those together um patrick i just have one correction to the minutes sure yeah uh, my last name was spelled wrong so it's oh. s-i-m-o-n-s instead of two m's uh, we'll sorry two i thought m's. i got that right the last time <laughs> i will make that correction on the ninth Thank minutes you. and there is no minutes on the 20th because we didn't have a quorum so i didn't keep minutes oh right okay, okay. that's right that's right that's what i'm thinking of um so with that correction, uh, do I have a second? All right, great. All in favor? Just raise your hands. Fine. We'll see you all. Perfect. All right, those are approved. And we'll turn this over to you, Teal. And I'm going to be looking at a different screen so I can see you guys better, see the presentation better. I'm going to drop the... Um, let me do this. I'll stop sharing my screen. And... Um, where is Keith on here? Keith. Yes. Keith, you should be a co-host now to be able to. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Yep. Working my way through this. All right. Well, why don't we get started? Good evening, everybody. We had very high hopes to be there in person with all of you tonight, but the weather didn't cooperate, which I guess we shouldn't be too surprised in the middle of January. Um, but here we are all virtually. Um, <clears throat> so we'll try to do this um, a little bit succinctly um, and improvise with a slideshow here. Keith, you want to go to the next one? So Keith's going to do the bulk of the presentation tonight, as he always does. Um, but tonight, we'll go through the schedule, talk a little bit about uh, some of the notes from your Midcoast facility tours uh, from a month ago, uh, go through maybe five, 10 minutes on the community engagement sessions that we had towards the end of the last year that were incredibly fruitful. Uh, but we want to really spend the bulk of the time talking about some of the initial program. We've spent uh, the majority of our meetings in 2023 getting up to this point uh, where we've talked about different program options. And our goal tonight really is to take that next step uh, in our series of tasks towards evaluating this community center. And that is to come up with an initial program, a little bit in a vacuum, um, so that we can take the next steps and work with our other consultants to come up with a revenue model and an operational cost so that all of you can take that in consideration with the program before we go on to the next steps in terms of site. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking at all of you um, just in terms of all of these things, but really want to open up space so that all of you can discuss as a committee where we've landed preliminarily with this program, if there are any edits you want to make as a committee to that program before we take those next steps with the rest of our consultants. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Keith and I might chime in here and there. And Keith, I can't hear you. I don't know if anybody else can. Testing, testing. There you go. Okay, great. Sorry, I have to do one, one moment. And just for everybody, while Keith's queuing that up, I know everybody's muted and we can only see like four or five people at a time. So if you raise your hand and I miss it, I apologize. Just unmute and just chime in quickly and we'll we'll kind of adapt that way just so everybody can be heard. So thank you. 
Okay, great, thanks. So, you know, about a third of the way chronologically through it, uh, you know, really, uh, we've we've had to be uh, a little flexible in how we're categorizing the different tasks. Uh, you know, the the goal at the end of task one was to have this um, program that we would use as, as a basis for the subsequent tasks. And so here we are really what we see this, this meeting as, you know, the conclusion of task one, setting us up to uh, look at some of the more, some of the details within task two, uh, where we're looking at, uh, starting to look at the cost and revenue, the, the final program, and then the site priorities, if not uh, the site itself. Uh, and then working towards, you know, uh, more of a, a, a building level of architecture uh, with floor plan diagrams, massing ideas, et cetera, um, and then uh, to a final report um, in the middle of the summer. Uh, looking ahead at what we're trying to accomplish and, and where we're setting ourselves up with. So uh, the, the, our, the meeting right now is not, not on the schedule, but setting up uh, for uh, the next meeting, which we are, I think there might be a session of, of finalizing the dates for the spring, uh, Todd, if not, if I'm, if I'm correct, at the end. So we've proposed a series of dates and, and you have some flexibility there, but you know what we're proposing uh, in a three weeks cadence is to have uh, that operational analysis. And we'll probably turn the bulk of the meeting over to Ballard King to go through that line by line. Of course, we'll make sure uh, we get that to the committee members um, in advance of that meeting. So you can really go through through it in the nitty gritty to see uh, the impacts of the various parts of the program on um, revenue and, and costs, et cetera. Uh, and then working towards uh, looking at the site, the how we plan on evaluating the sites. And so this will be a good discussion talking about setting the priorities for the sites. Uh, and this isn't the site analysis yet. This is really kind of trying to understand. Uh, we, we we have a proposed uh, schedule for um, for evaluating and scoring sites. And, and we want to make sure that we're, uh, once we start looking at any potential sites, we're talking about the the same kind of qualities and and understanding the scoring in a similar way that we can level the scores and, and get a sense of uh, a common consensus for uh, for the sites themselves. We'll also probably, probably bring in um, Weston Sampson, who is also our aquatics uh, specialist to talk about some pool options. There's been some questions about how the different pool shapes uh, impact, um, you know, just the impacts generally and, and use and operation, et cetera. So um, we'll probably do a little a workshop uh, about the pool options. And then we'll we'll start looking a little bit at, at test fits about how some of these spaces lay out and, and size. Now that we, at that point, we'll have uh, the, the program and then, you know, the, the order of magnitude of parking and, and field requirements. Um, and then working towards, you know, later uh, in March uh, and April, uh, looking hopefully uh, maybe test fitting some sites or leveling the sites. Uh, and then working towards the towards April 11th, we're proposing to have a, a site and program uh, open house. And so that would be the op opportunity to uh, bring the uh, vetted program with cost imp impacts and membership info, uh, as well as uh, the manner we're looking at sites and and some ideas about look and feel to the public uh, as another opportunity to to get the buy-in from the community and make sure that we're you know marching in uh, in uh, a, a direction that people feel they're they're comfortable with um as you mentioned I'm I'll go through this kind of quickly because we had a really great turnout at uh, Scarborough community services hosted the facility tours on the 9th that was a, a great morning of seeing uh, mid coast facilities um it, Everyone should have had this deck for you know for a week at this point, and so we're not going to go through a, lo a lot of it. And feel if anyone has comments about this, if it um, you know this, I think this is you know fodder for a discussion we're going to have at the end of the session. But if there's uh, anything want anyone wants to uh, chime in on about any specific uh, images or whatnot, uh, I'll try to just give a, a, a quick overview, and, and we can always obviously always return to this. So you went to Booth Bay YMCA, uh, Wiscasset Community Center, and Bath Family YMCA, and you know between 27 and then almost you know probably more than double the size booth bay uh really a range of of vintages uh and you know booth bay was was an older facility and then recently updated and expanded bath is is wholly new whisk acid is uh is one that's kind of medium age uh with, with some updates here and there um and then you know a, a range of of pool styles uh separate square therapy pools versus uh separate rooms entirely eight lane pool with um uh, with a separate pool Wiscasset had a pool that was connected, uh, so we we really see the range of some of the ideas that we've we've been talking about at this point, and then you know a, a lot of similarities between them in terms of uh, you know fitness center, and the size of basketball courts, some, some consistency there, uh, and and track size, but of course each have their uh, pluses and minuses. Um, and some images. I'm I'm not gonna. This is. 
uh, just images of, uh, except for the kitchen. I'm sorry, I apologize to a Knickerbocker group. I had to grab, grab this from your website, but um, some images of, of our site tours that day, uh, just to give people a, a flavor who weren't able to attend uh, Booth Bay YMCA, which I think everyone was, was was really impressed with. It seemed like a great facility. Um, and again, we can uh, we can come back to some of these comments, or if anyone wants to pull it out, or uh, people can look uh, offline at their leisure um, to some of the relevant comments. Uh, but just to, to headline it, people really like the track. Uh, the 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 field house was an interesting format. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't structured around basketball, right? I mean, there were basketball courts, there were pickleball courts, but um, it I think people liked the lightness of it, and the track seemed great. Uh, you know, it's long straightaways, but just a kind of a different format, uh, and seems to be getting you know a lot of use at, uh, with pickleball right now. Uh, problems with with sight lines in in the pool. Um, and uh, it seems like they really made the best of their situation and putting a lot of the fitness in, in the basement, uh, trying to make that uh, a, a nice space to to be in and, you know, reasonably successful. Uh, great visit to Wiscasset Community Center, you know, on, on the smaller side, one big gym uh, and a six lane pool and a senior center. Um, and those are kind of the big programmatic elements. Again, this is where the pool is connected to the six six lane, um, which really beautiful structure here. Um, but uh, there is kind of limited deck space and uh, and it was maybe tough for parents to see uh, children who were in, in the connected uh, recreation pool. And then the bath area family YMCA, which had a, a was very rec focused, apart from uh, also having some daycare facilities, um, really impressive pool, uh, eight lanes with a separate uh, disconnected pool, a big bleacher area. Um, and that was not surprising. Uh, the recreational swimming, lap swimming and, and the swimming for the for the high school is a really big program there. And they have a, their own you know, walk of fame uh, on on the mezzanine, uh, and so that, that that's a big piece of their program. So they obviously lavished a lot of uh, attention with pro uh, programming the space uh, and and getting it uh, pretty good for them. So good sight lines, um, a lot of spectator seating, and I can imagine those it'd be on those um, uh, meet days uh, pretty full, and some some really great things about this. But of course, you know, like anything, um, some shortcomings, and some general observations um, that people that we pulled out that kind of related maybe to uh, a whole morning of seeing the, these facilities or, or some some common uh, common responses. You know, I think one of the big takeaways is storage. Uh, everyone we talked to said there, there's not enough storage, especially when you're trying to program uh, multiple activities in, in uh, every space um, or a single space would have multiple activities. You end up just really running out of storage quickly. And it was surprising to see how little storage there was or, or how difficult it was to access. So that's a uh, that really uh, not thrilling, but very important. I'm sure Todd can <laughs> weigh in when it comes to uh, making these facilities operate. Um, and then uh, uh, two days before, we had a, a great community, a day of community engagement workshops, um, uh, really focused around activities for these um, for these spaces. It was consisted of. Uh, to a, a lunch at the middle school uh, and two sessions at lunch at the high school. And then an afternoon we were camped out at the hub uh, where we uh, engaged with uh, folks who were doing a gingerbread construction uh, workshop. And then we were, uh, we were uh, just in attendance as an open house for people to come in. Uh, and again, we, we don't need to go through all, all these, but it was, it was really helpful. You definitely saw uh, both in the middle school and the high school an interest in some of the non-rec um, aquatics programs, so you know, lifeguard training, uh, lazy river, inflatable obstacle course, water slide. You know, you, you can you can tell that both middle school and high schoolers were looking for a place to go with their friends, you know, in the winter or or on the weekends. It definitely uh, as and there was some interested in swim club, et cetera, but everyone seemed to like some of those ideas. Uh, and then you know, really, uh, you know, some some kind of flexibility in the uh, in the in indoor sports, uh, open gym, indoor soccer, uh, et cetera, uh, and then. If yeah, I could please. just comment, just um, one of the comments that I heard from my staff after the middle school, which was not surprising because our kiddos are pretty smart and tuned in, um, but my staff that had joined Key, um, the kids really concerned about access. And again, when we talk about sight down the road, um, you know, they're like, we either need to be able to walk to it or we need to have scheduled shuttles so we can access it. And that came directly from the kids. So I thought that was very insightful and 
again, you as a, uh, an ad hoc had kind of chatted about that, and that is on your scoring uh, sheet when, you, when we get to that point, you know, in a few meetings. So just uh, – it definitely resonated out of the out of the out of the mouth of babes, so it's perfect. So, yeah, yeah. Also, ac access for you know some of the fitness facilities. You know, kids who are 13, 14, 15, they're concerned that they would be able to use some of these spaces. Um, you know, either on their own or you know not necessarily with par parental supervision. So I think people are thinking, yeah, you know, uh, students were thinking ahead towards you know an afternoon going over there and and being able to use it on on their own uh, in some manner. Um, uh, and so we were at the high school for uh, two lunch sessions and you know, similar feedback, kind of more on, on um, some eSports, e uh, Fortnite, project graduation, game room was definitely uh, striking a chord with, with some of those, uh, those students. Um, and again, similar comments for aquatics. And then everyone seemed to pull out the importance of, of some kind of a communal outdoor space, whether it's sports courts or community garden, outdoor patio. Uh, that came up actually uh, in almost every session we, uh, we talked to students with. And then uh, we actually had more questions than just related to program, which we'll, uh, we'll elaborate on and share uh, in, in the future in, in uh, future sessions where we talk about site and kind of the qualitative aspects of the project. Um, but uh, pulling out some of the, the program that uh, adults were interested in, you know, much more lap pool, uh, uh, dancing, walking track, uh, Zumba, um, and then related to having, you know, having children before and after care, um, excuse me, swim lessons actually came up quite a bit uh, and, and water aerobics. And so these are not, not terribly surprising, but you, you definitely see um, kind of coalescing around uh, different, the, the types of aquatics uh, that uh, you see, that you'd see, which is definitely more towards the, the um, uh, group uh, activities in that, in that secondary pool as, to, as opposed to necessarily the lap pool swimming. So pretty important uh, piece of the program. Um, and again, just pulling out some of the the salient points, which uh, I'll I'll let people peruse on their own. Um, and and so you know that that really brings us to the draft program options. You know, at this point, we've we had some uh, a, a great opportunity to see some of the other program. To we we talked about it. We we talked about some of the ideas around it. We got to go see it in person. Uh, and then feedback from uh, and and direct interaction with people at the open house, especially uh, trying to understand uh, where people thought the, some of the shortcomings were and and what activities they want to uh, en engage with. Um, and we feel like at this point, it's uh, we we've, we've been trying to shape that into this uh, draft program, which we distributed in uh, one form or another since uh, at, at the end of November. And so this is really now the opportunity to. Uh, to go through these in in, in any manner um, and open up to just a discussion about uh, how, how some of the uh, things that we've seen over the last uh, month and a half, or really uh, since the beginning of the project, have have shaped uh, thoughts about um, where this program uh, is heading. Um, so I'm really just going to open the floor and we can try to shape the discussion. But if, if people have uh, initial uh, feedback, and again, we can zoom back to uh, elements from our site visits, et cetera. Okay, maybe, great. maybe while while people uh, come up with some initial feedback, if you can just really quickly explain each of the columns here, so the the category, the description, the square footage, the number, and so on, and how the what the subtotal versus gross means. Yep, sure thing. Thank you. Yep. So obviously, we we've grouped these into uh, a, a couple of buckets, trying to be really consistent with how we're showing in the coloring, et cetera. Um, you know, entry lobby, kind of those those first immediate spaces that you encounter. Sports and fitness, fitness really encompass uh, the you know the the gym, the gym, gym storage, fitness and fitness studio, the aquatics, uh, everything associated with that, down to mechanical and storage and the offices associated with just that. Community would be all those spaces, multi-purpose room, storage. Um, uh, the kitchen, et cetera. Sports spaces are really all those uh, necessary building uh, portions that you have to have um, to go along with with the operations. And then the Scarborough Community Services, you know, we had been uh, assuming, and I think everything's up for discussion, that the, the when the lease is up at the, uh, the hub, that uh, there would be space for the community services in, in the building. And so, you know, just a, 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 a quick uh, understanding of the takeoffs required for, uh, for Todd and, and his staff. Uh, the unit square foot on the uh, kind of middle column uh, is is really you know 
per unit, the size that we're talking about, and then the number, and then the subtotal would be, you know, the first column unit square footage times the number. And then we applied a grossing factor, uh, which is, um, you know, around between, uh, between it ranges really 15, 20, 25%. It depends uh, whether you're talking about something like um, the gymnasium or uh, fitness spaces, like some of those big uh, spaces might have smaller grossing factor to complement to uh, imagine that there'd be circulation for the building, uh, you know, e egress um, approach, et cetera, um, versus more cellular spaces, smaller spaces like the community services, which is basically a small office building that's going to have a little higher grossing factor just because uh, you need some more of that auxiliary space um, and egress uh, uh, in in proportion to the um, to the program itself, and so that that. Uh, you have the subtotal uh, added uh, with the grossing factor, and then at the bottom is the gross building square foot um, right here. So we're looking at something that's about in between 60 and, and 74,000 square feet, uh, just what's on the screen um, before looking at, um, you know, before the discussion opens. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's uh, maybe take. I don't know if we would need to take this in exact order of the spreadsheet, but um, can we talk about the pools first? Maybe get get feedback on that, since that's kind of one of the obviously the primary components. We saw it in every focus group. It's been a topic of every single community survey that's gone out in the last ten or fifteen years. Um, can we can we as a committee tick off that this is the representation of what we want to see in the possible plan that would go forward um, to the council for vetting, et cetera, along the way. So, and that's the goal really, right? We want to be able to pull this together and give them, you know, this is what a building with this type of, of program options and facilities would look like. And then we'll get to the next few steps about how much land you would need to be able to have a building of that size and et cetera, et cetera. But this is kind of the building block portion of the of, of our work, the way I see it. And we just need to kind of check off and say, yep, we're, we, we, we agree this, this is the right type of pool and the right number of pools. Um, so let's talk about that one first. I'd be happy to have anybody chime in who'd like to give feedback on that, what we have there. Patrick, I'll jump in because I've got a couple of questions. Um, the secondary pool size looks like it's almost as big as the eight lane pool. And um, personally, I'm not convinced that we need a huge secondary pool. I I, um, I did, I guess, uh, um, I was convinced to, uh, at the during the tours that maybe we did need a second, second pool, but I'm not convinced it needs to be as big as the other pool. Um, can you explain um, how you came up with that size and what that entails? And also, um, just considering the shape of the pool, um, because I think we're going to have to be consider considering costs, and and I'm sure that a shape a, a second pool that's shaped oddly is going to cost a lot more. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think the 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 secondary pool we're we're showing uh, right here, you know, includes the 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 pool deck and kind of a, a amorphous shaped pool in the center. There's certainly an option to to go with something that, that's smaller. Um, if you look at, um, if I were to zoom back real quick, um, you know, just to look at some some of the other options. Um, uh, Whisk acid is definitely. This doesn't give you a really great uh, sense of of the size, but um, no, of course it doesn't show a nuts one either. Um, you wind up seeing for just the square shape pool, uh, something that's more like about 50% or so of the actual pool size. Um, plus there'd be the deck space, which just because they, they kind of have to be similar in size, uh, you wind up with about 60% of the size uh, between the two, the secondary pool and, and the lap pool. Um, but you're, you're, Right, and we can direct, um, you know, some we can interrogate that a little more with Weston and Samson, especially, um, you know, to find out, um, you know, their their sense of the direction, whether or not, um, you know, municipalities are seeing, um, 
having the greater flexibility with a square pool versus one that's got more of a kind of casual shape and different kind of nooks and crannies, uh, which may be more um, explicitly programmed, um, whether there's a there's a, a greater increase in cost in there. Um, that's that's certainly a good question. And I think, yeah, there, is it, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, just to clarify, um, make sure that I'm on the same page. So the, the square footage is the square footage of the building that it would take to encompass a a second pool with, you know, the deck space. We And we saw this, right? We saw a lot of storage on the deck space on that side. We saw um, places for um, instruction and other types of activities, kind of games and things like that on the deck. Um, so that's that's not necessarily saying we're going to have a second pool of a similar water volume. Obviously, it's going to be a much smaller water volume, but it's going to be it's going to take up some space because of all the ancillary activities that go on around that type of pool. Is that is that a fair summary? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, I think there's going to be uh, depending on the format that maybe Spectre is seating, there's definitely going to be a uh, team seating you know if there's a if there's a meet going on we saw in certain pools especially um bath you know they were using uh both alongside within the lap pool but then the uh the secondary pool they were using that for warm-up space and basically just spaces to put bodies teen bodies while they're waiting for their events to happen uh so real you know, bet between those two spaces they're they're all being used uh, uh on on a lot of those uh competition days so let's so, so let's call it ten thousand square feet, basically, because that spectator seating is more or less going to be associated or aligned with the competition pool, primarily, probably. So that's ninety seven hundred. So, so around to say it's ten grand and ten ten thousand square feet and seven thousand. So it's it's you know less than three quarters of the size in terms of square footage for the competition area, including the seating. Patrick, thanks for asking that question for that clarification, because I was envisioning that being um, in proportion to the pool size. Amelia, do you have a question? Yeah, or so comment? my question, well, I just wanted to clarify just to make sure I understand. So all of this data, all of um, these options are based strictly on what we've seen, what we think we want, the feedback of what the community wants. At this juncture, we have not put the um, frame of what can produce revenue and and help with the defray the cost of anything at this point. Correct. And that's really, okay. you know, it, it, it happens in sequence. We need a starting point. So we kind of yep. want to get the committee's buy-in on the starting point, and then we're yep. going to run those models. This is our wish list. Yeah, this is a, this is a, you know, this is a, a I wouldn't call it a, a wish list because to me it's a it's a business model and there this is the next step for us as a community as once you guys validate a starting point for them yeah. as yeah. far as square footage, then they'll be able to come back with okay, it's gonna whatever you give them as a go tonight, they'll then with their other firms and their cohorts will come back and say, Okay, here's what it costs to operate what you have right now, yeah. or potentially could have, and then here's the offsetting revenue. And then to, you know, to Gwen's point is, you know, too big, too small, they'll be able to slide factor that, you know, it's not all relative where, you know, if it costs a million dollars to build something and, and you know, 500000 to operate and it makes $300,000 in revenue, those proportions are all the same when you make it smaller, right? It doesn't go down 200 and down 100. Operational costs will factor and revenue will go down the most. Um, and so that, yeah, that's what we're trying to get through tonight is for you guys to say, okay, we're comfortable giving this to these guys to be able to start giving us the numbers for you guys to really start making those push and pulls. Um, the other only other comment I will make around a rec pool is, and I'm glad, Patrick, thank you for asking that, is um, some of the rec secondary pools that I've seen, um, and you pro it's probably a better example on the big pool, when the, when a lot of these secondary pools, you want to be able to access from multiple sides. And so that's why sometimes the deck space is a lot bigger than the actual water square footage, because then you can have, it feels bigger, right? You can have people on all three sides of it or four sides of it and different access points. So you can have, you know, you can have 50, the challenge with the Wiscasset pool is you can only get it from it from two sides. And then one side was four feet. So that eliminated a lot of people that couldn't jump in. So, um, those are kind of a design factor that I look forward to hearing kind of what those pros and cons are. Tom, I, I, I have one quick question too. So 
a lot of the places we saw, not was cast, but like uh, like for Bath, their spectator seating was all inside the building, but it was elevated. It yeah. was up above. So it wasn't in a space. Same with Booth Bay. It was elevated, but it wasn't really space. But is that factored in? Because then you have to go two stories where they get the thousand. It wasn't a thousand feet necessarily of new space to stand alone bleachers because it was on a second deck, you know. But is that kind of still factor in there because they all they were all part of two story buildings? Like was Cassid's spectator seating was literally right on the edge of the pool. The other yeah. ones were elevated where they took up less. There was more stuff going on. But it was like duplicating the space. Does that make sense? So they made a thousand feet of bleachers up there, but there was deck space below it and things like that. So it didn't didn't necessarily add to the square footage of the building to put it up there because of the way the building was structured with the elevated track and all that. So I just don't know how that plays into this, like how that thousand feet figures in because it's not necessarily making the building a thousand feet wider because it was second story. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just don't know those answers. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's uh, it, it's true you're not in some ways building more volume, but there is still finishes and equipment associated with that, um, those spaces. And so, you know, that can be programmed underneath it. You know, the, that, that elevator specter seating will be over offices. It'll be over you know, the aquatics office. It might be over a portion of the, like the locker rooms, et cetera. Um, but unfortunately it's not quite the found space that would be nice to, uh, to find in the same way. Um, so it, it, it is, it is figuring you know, this is, this is uh, really the beginning, and we're going to be looking at, you know, kind of kind of sightless versions, like a two-story versus one-story, um, and then, you know, it, it there is a, a difference in paying for, you know, a, a two-story. You generate, you have an elevator, you have, you know, two at least two sets of stairs, things like that that are kind of baked into it. So it's it's just really when you're talking about, you know, cost per square foot or square foot size, it's really difficult to to. Uh, I mean, these these are guidelines to work around as opposed to something that you can you know, really hard and fast rely on, fortunately. Anybody else on that stuff? Uh, I, this is Jim Weaver. I, I did have a question. When we did the site visits there, obviously two of the locations had uh, six lane pools and then the, the big one at Bath. Uh, it seems that the justification for the two additional lanes was primarily for the high school uh, competition, be able to host, host the high school competitions. Uh, in my mind, uh, that that's going to be a critical element in getting this project approved, uh, that we're going to really have to have rely on the support of the of the competition or the high school swim people uh, to show the justification for that uh, two additional lanes because it seemed like for the two that we saw the six lanes met the needs of the community but the additional two lanes was really related to the high school competition uh, and the the cost differential, I'd, I'd, at some point, I'd like to see what that impact of those two additional lanes are, especially given the uh, significant vote for the school project in the fall. Uh, eventually, cost is going to come down here uh, to be a major a major issue. So that it it seems like it's a cost issue and garnering support from the people who will take advantage of those two extra lanes, which seems to me it's the high school swim team that's going to be the uh, beneficiary of those two additional lanes. But Jim, I, I do think, though, that that one thing, I don't know if it was just the high school team, though. It was their swim club. Well, so yes, it, but it was the but, competition. But still, right, it's still youth. Yeah, it was still more youth-based than adult recreation, you know, like swimming laps type of thing, but it was that club which we don't have one now. So will it garner enough? I think is what you're saying, right? Like you, you, we're gonna have to build up that club to a significant space to justify that additional cost. Yes, because if the two extra lanes are only you would be only used for competitions, and there are a limited number of competitions annually, whether that's six or eight or ten or whatever that number is, there's still a lot of time. Uh, that they may be underutilized. Jim, I think that's a good point. The other consideration, again, we can lean on 
some of the consultants, but uh, just a factor to remember is Scarborough is four to five times larger than the communities we looked at for the mm -hmm. six lane pools as well. So when you talk about users doing lap swim, four or five people on a circle swim on a lap period, an hour or two hours, you know, three people in a lane with six is 18. So those factors, as far as how many, when you're talking about trying to sell a membership. Um, so one of the questions that I had for consideration when you guys get down to the run and we get feedback from the consultants is, you know, um, uh, again, um, uh, how that affects um, with based on our population, are we in that range? Um, you know, you don't want to build something too small from the beginning, but again, your point is well taken cost and building something that's oversized is not what we want to do either. So I'd be curious from the consultants when we get to that point as far as comparatively for population. Yes, because I think when we were at, when we were at Bath, there was one person swimming laps. Uh, uh, Wiscasset, I don't know that I saw anybody. Uh, and I mean, uh, Booth Bay was was one Bath. Uh, so it's it's just that's just the question is how much uh, people like the idea of a pool. Um, but it didn't look like from the day we were there. I don't know if that was representative or not, but certainly they weren't uh, being overused. Jim, I can um, comment. I, I swim at Cape right now. I've, I've also swim at um, South Portland. Um, Cape has six lanes and they're always full mm -hmm. and they're busy all day long. Um, and, and actually last weekend when I was there, I met two people who were from out of state happened to be up here working or something and they were going all the way to Cape to swim. So I think um, it certainly wouldn't sit unused. Um, so, you know, it, it, in terms of, um, it, I, I don't think the eight lanes would just be serving the schools or the swim teams. I think the public at large would benefit from eight lanes as well. Okay, well, and, and that was and the other question I or the other observation I had is two of the sites were YMCA's and one was a community. So mm -hmm. I think Wiscasset was the community, and then the other two was was a YMCA. And I don't know whether that has any fundamental difference between a YMCA seems to be, uh, or the question is whether it, fundamentally it's different if you're at a YMCA versus a community facility or if it's just in the name I, I don't know yeah not really in the operation it's more in the philosophy and the messaging and who owns it mm -hmm. and who sets the schedules but as far as facility and design um it's the same common theories as far as size and shape of things mm -hmm. so okay so i guess what we're thinking about here is uh in my mind is let's uh let's give a thumbs up for a thumbs down on yeah. or tweak whatever we want to tweak in that aquatic section. But I, I think the the rinse off zone, the spectator area, all that stuff, I think those are good placeholder numbers. Um, the pool equipment pumps, I, I think that that's probably all formulaic driven, I'm guessing on their side. And we'll get more feedback on that, right? So I mean, this might not be where we end up, but this is, this is the starting point. So I'm hearing that we want to hear a little bit more of a, you know, cost benefit analysis CBA on six lanes versus eight lanes. And then obviously the, the secondary pool and the, the, you know, the rent factor and all that stuff with that. So we, we definitely want to hear a little bit more on the financials on that, but we need to have something to start with to be able to have them do that analysis for us. Patrick, Bill has his hand up. I missed that. So go ahead, Bill. Hey. <clears throat> Uh, I'm, I enjoyed this discussion. I think this is, uh, uh, I'm glad, Patrick, that you started with the, the pool area because I think we as a group need to decide where are our priorities? What, what do we want to focus on? And it seems to me that the pool is a good place to start, that <clears throat> we don't have one in Scarborough. We're a big community. Uh, uh, indoor swimming, I think, is a popular, super popular activity. Uh, and therefore, uh, I really endorse this idea of giving, amongst our priorities, giving the pool some deference. Uh, uh, looking at the three facilities we looked at, uh, they're all in the 40 to 50,000 square foot, whereas the square footage in the proposal that we have 
roughly before us uh, is substantially larger. But I think Todd's point about the size of our community is quite legitimate uh, and that we probably may need a facility that is larger. Uh, uh, the financial analysis, I think on six or eight will be interesting and important for us to decide. Uh, uh, I think that we are, we want to get this thing passed. Uh, we want to have the community center approved. And as we've seen from the last year to two years, uh, it's a it's a tough haul uphill. Uh, and therefore, uh, I was just making a note that uh, it was Gwen's comment about cost is important. Well, I think that's true. I think that the community is going to take that. And if they think that we're kind of going for just uh, uh, excesses, we're in trouble. Uh, I actually think this is going to be a tough one to win no matter what. Uh, but I think we'll, we've learned from the schools, we've learned from the library. I think we can make a great presentation uh, uh, for the community. Uh, the community people, I think, who are going to come out and vote are going to be older people. And I think we should take that into account because that's historically true. Uh, but at this point, I put the pool as a priority at the top of my list uh, in terms of the importance of facilities. That and community space uh, that is less, uh, less focused on uh, a specific activity uh, that has multiple purposes. So those are sort of my initial thoughts. Um, Bill, I totally agree with you. I looked at this the same way as, um, you know, in terms of prioritizing the pool, the things that we don't have, prioritizing those first. And then, um, you know, thinking about the, even with even within the things that we don't have that we need, um, where can we trim cost? But also um, in terms of anything else that we might want but not need, um, then really prioritizing our decisions based on whether there's other private resources or other community resources for those things so that we're not duplicating um, anything that already exists or providing services that people already you know, pay for elsewhere. I don't think we wanna um, ask the task taxpayers to subsidize things that um, that people have to pay for anyway, such as after school care, um, daycare um, to some extent. Um, so that's kind of my two cents on the on the budget priorities, but otherwise I'll shut up. <laughs> and it, it'd be interesting. It's, it's funny. I think the two couple of things you mentioned at the end there are probably the most lucrative in terms of profitability of the of the facility. Um, so it's it, it is going to take a tremendous amount of education and understanding of what That's needs true. to be the message to to the community as we move forward in this process. So all all good stuff. Yeah, um, totally uh, true, Patrick. Like if if then that's what um you know when I say that I, I with qualifying what I just said, if something does um, create a cost, then it needs to be budget neutral somehow. If it's something that people will pay for or should pay for anyway, then um, we want to make sure that we're recouping the cost to operate it. Yeah. Well, it's important to remember though, that through all of these studies and all of these questionnaires, people are asking for this. I mean, they are, they are asking for a pool. They are asking for a community center and it is not like a school or a library in that we, it's substantially, um, there's, a lot of opportunity for revenue generation. So I agree, it's a huge uphill, it is. But when I get discouraged, I remember those two things. People want this and we can um, offset a lot of the cost. Um, uh, Jean Marie speaking here. Um, I've been following along with this. And of course I sit in the middle of the maelstrom uh, with anything to do with budgeting and what goes on ballots and, what the, whatever, whatever. Um, 
yeah, a pool needs to be the focus. Um, every group, community group that I stalk on Facebook, um, they they're all they all talk about a pool. You know, they'd be welcoming a pool. Uh, concerned taxpayer members that I've talked to are like, well, we'd like a pool. Um, so the pool would be a major selling point, if you want to call it that. And it is something that I can't believe that after all these years, this town still doesn't have a pool. That's crazy. Um, and then, um, yeah, take it from there. But I agree with Bill and Gwen that we don't need to be re or that's, let me just use the word duplicating instead of saying reduplicating, because that'd be crazy. Duplicating, um, you know, things like weights, weight rooms, or even yoga rooms, or, you know, doesn't mean you can't offer that as programs, but I wouldn't have spaces that are specifically designated for that. Now, as far as the child care, there's not enough child care in town, and they, Todd, you have waiting lists for child care all the time, don't you? Yeah, I mean, at, at, yes, we have we have child care waiting lists all the time and it is profitable. The challenge with child care is span of control and staffing right. is, yeah. always, is always the challenge, and, and, you know, everywhere we go. So, um, yeah. And when I see child care from a town point of view, I see it as the before and after school care in particular. Um, and. Even when you get into that middle school age, I know way back when, when my daughter was in Scarborough, they did have a pretty successful middle school program that thankfully she was able to take part in because, you know, when you're a seventh, eighth grade, you know, that age group, they're not quite old enough to be hanging by themselves, in my opinion. But um, anyway, um, that's just my two cents worth on on what we need to be looking at. But pool, pool, pool is what I hear all the time. We need a pool. I want a pool. I want a place to swim. Pool, pool, pool. So, you know, if we can uh, keep that in mind. So, so what I'm hearing is that we need to put the eight lane pool on the wish list. Um, but I think we're going to have to do a really big, strong cost breakdown as a reminder. There are like five or six other pools, though, close by and some of the other things. So we have to balance that with what we want to ask for. But I mean. I think we have to, in the end of this, we'll have to break down exactly what a pool costs, you know, in square footage and cost to operate and how we offset those costs. I think that'll be a big part of the selling point to the people is that we want the pool. Everybody wants the pool. It's on everybody's list. This is what it will actually cost to build it, run it, maintain it, and memberships. And then people have to decide, I guess, at that point, if they're going to spend that, if that offsets enough or not. And I don't know that answer, but we're a long way from that. But I think it's pretty inevitable. We all think that we need this eight lane pool to, as a starting point. Maybe it trims to six when we get those other numbers, but I think eight's where we have to start. Okay, I think we have consensus on that point. Let's let's move on. Um, I don't I don't feel like we need to vote on each one of these sections. I think if anybody has strong feelings, they want to get that on the record. That's that's certainly fine. And if we do want to change some numbers, we can do that. But I didn't hear any specific. Um, request to change anything in that aquatic section. So let's let them fly with with that. Um, I like Bill's idea about going to the community space next. And actually, maybe sports and fitness is that's the next biggest piece. We should talk about that. Why don't we do that? Actually, now that I look at these numbers a little bit more. Um, so I'll, I'll kick us off really quickly. Um, I I think that the the court space brings people in no matter what you're going to do with it. And you see the list there in that cell next to gymnasium. Um, that, that aside from the pool, that will be the thing that will bring, bring people in to use the facility. You just, we've heard it over and over again, how the school gyms are not accessible during the school day. And then they're used by sports teams and you have to use them at, you know, maybe starting at eight or nine o'clock at night. And then maybe on the weekends and some, some parts of the year, um, so that's that's a big thing. And we and and the gyms that we were at were were full. I mean, there was a lull, I think, in in Bath, but there was they were the court the basketball courts were still being used. They had a gymnastics class going on in that one end. Um, but the other gyms were just there was they were full with somebody, and then there were the hallways were full with people waiting to go in the next session. 
Um, I, I think that those types of activities um, and the availability of court space for, I mean, this is just a small list. Why do we get 10 things on this list? And there's probably another 10 that you could add to it, right? I, I think it makes sense to have I mean, I could be convinced to have a three to have three courts, and maybe the numbers might bear out four. But I think three is a good starting point. Is that what the is it? We're at, we're at. How how would you categorize this in those diagrams that you have there, Keith? That were in the packet. Which what what is this fourteen thousand square feet represent in the diagrams? Yeah, sure. Actually, I have these ready. You know, one one thing I did add is just as a point of comparison, just I, I modeled up basically what we saw at. at um, I think Wiscasset and Booth Bay, which is, you know, it it there's a lot of crossing, you know, court lines here, but basically there's one competition size, high school competition size court that's you know in the clear, and then uh kind of two smaller practice courts that are crossing. So that was that's a pretty common format. Just putting that not saying that necessarily the one on the table. But you know, I think what we were holding at the moment was something more like this, which is uh two, which you know, we we talked about, you know, we wanna might not don't want to clip the corners here and we can tweak the sizes, but something along the 14,000 square foot uh, gym format. I think that's what's currently uh, in the pro forma. It, was that similar to the one we saw in Bath that had like the two and a half or, or is that even bigger than this? One? Uh, I believe yeah. Bath I think that was, was three. this plus a half. Yeah. Three. Yeah. And Bath was a little different. Their, their full court ran. Bass was more rectangle. Their court ran left, uh, east west, and then the third court was so they ran their side one sideways. It's almost flipped. It's tough uh, enough. But I think they the could bass, do two this way, right? Todd meant a third one if they wanted to, but then they had the full length. Right. So end. they they really could have a full court and a half, or run three small courts. I right. think Bath was around twelve thousand square feet, um, but again, this is two full courts where you can get four sideways running courts for like that sub 12 year old you know age group you can run four games at one time I'd like that, is that also um equivalent to four pickleball courts if we're doing it's probably like 18 to 20 pickleball courts on one you know on one high school basketball court depending on how close you want to get it together like the wiscasset court had three pickleball courts painted in the center of the courts they use the end lines and then the middle and they had they had great space they probably could get four on that court so you're in that eight to twelve pickleball range depending okay. on how wide and depth you get there so so just to be clear you you have included the one court two practice courts not the two courts no i think you did the two courts i did the two courts yep okay Okay. And and if I recall, this um these were the lowest cost, highest revenue. The gymnasium space. I think I remember somebody yeah. saying that that was the that, that was the case right, of all yeah. the different major groups of spaces in the buildings. Yeah. So for that's great. The, also operationally too. Yeah. So for the reason that number one is is what people want. I mean, there's a high demand and two, the economics of it. I would think this would be right up there with the pool for priority. I thought that it was interesting at Booth Bay, they had the field house. I know they were separated from the expansion, but the field house when we went in had the hoops up and it was more pickleball, but they also had a separate gym, right? Am I getting that confused? They had no, basketball they going on the hardwood floor. And then they had that turf space, which wasn't being super utilized because youth it's it's obviously basketball season when we went. But man, there was an awful lot of opportunity there above the gym. So they had that was set up as multi course, multi sport, multi everything. But they also had that dedicated space on the other side, which I think they had that fitness studio off of. But it was interesting. They were the only ones that had like that court separated from the other ones. And just for point of reference, that Booth Bay court has been around. I don't know when the building was built, oh. but they've taken great pride to keep that court since the day it opened. Um, all the way to the bird's nest where you got to climb a ladder to get to the scoring table. I mean, you know, that's an icon in that area. So um, I think everything else came from, from, from difference, but I think that's why they just didn't want to um, affect that court at all, kind of their pride. So my take on it is exactly what was just brought up, I think, is that, that because of the multifaceted use of this space and the demand of all the different sports, clubs, fitness, whatever it is, 
and it, and the high demand and the high revenue that the more you can eke into the building in court space slash whatever this is called is probably going to serve the community well just because we know there's demand and it's profitable and it's if it's one big room it's easier to build especially if you could do like we saw a lot i love that booth bay walking gym above the court i know you couldn't stop and watch it's practice there but making use of that big open space was a pretty nice feature the way they did that a question that i had is on the two court option uh with the elevated uh walking track what what is what's the uh uh how many laps per mile obviously the bigger the court size the the more the less laps per mile that you've got do you, do you have a number roughly i do i have to dig back into uh yes just give me can you give me one moment um was it bats like 19 or 16 it was high so it was a big number yeah higher than Should you would think uh, yeah. the two court that we're showing is about 13 laps a mile um yeah so like a the one and a half version is 16 laps a mile or, or, or sorry the the one court two practice court one right here that's a uh, 16 laps a mile in the big four court option four cart would be eight laps a mile so you're 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 getting almost to a indoor track level you know yeah. that's that's fairly standard 200 200 meters almost or so is there any demand for a, in between those? I mean, so I guess obviously the square footage kind of, if you add it up, I guess it's kind of about, it's about 7,000 ish square feet per court, 7204. I mean, that's what you kind of have on there. If I just don't know if three is a better number, we have one, <laughs> two, four. I'm know. wondering the same thing if we should see what three looks like, and then we could always scale back to the two or two plus of additional open space in some other part of the building or some other format. I, I don't, what, what are people thinking? I, I think two is a baseline. I think that's like, I don't think we would be any lower than two. So I don't know what we are, what we're testing. If it's really giving us an idea about where we could, where we could push or where we could cut with two. I think the three, I think the three court option gives you a lot more flexibility. Plus it, it gives you a, a longer, track i i think those small tracks is going to be uh, pretty monotonous and it gives you i think to patrick's point uh it gives you a place where when you start looking about build costs and you know if, if you if you need to go down i think based on the data and the use and what we turn away two is really a minimum footprint i think for a demand in scarborough so to the point of having a place to go down um you know, that gives you some options there too when you guys get into the financials of what it costs to build, operate, and offset. You know, uh, uh, I I would say that Todd runs these programs. He knows what kind of demand exists. And so when, when he speaks, I listen. Uh, and I mean, I would, I think that the level of demand for uh, wintertime activities in there, two at a minimum, three may be the sweet spot. Uh, but I guess I'd look to Todd uh, for advice on that. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, again, it's, I I can speak progr programmatically without seeing the cost of, I, I'm really curious when we get to the next phase, that's what I'm most excited about, to see the cost to build, the revenue and the operational cost, because that's really where the rubber meets the road. But anytime, I guess what I'll say, Bill, to answer that question is anytime you have greater capacity, whether that's square footage in a room, uh, basketball court, more lap lanes, there's less chance for scheduling conflict. And what I mean by that, if you had three gymnasiums, you could be running one for childcare after school, one for team members and having a practice going on. If you only have one, everybody's you know, rotating you get it, I get it, she gets it, it just keeps flipping. And so when you have more space, people will acquire more time. There's nothing more frustrating to a member than I bought a membership because I really want to shoot hoops, but I can never get open gym time because it's always scheduled for a practice. Or 
I want to take my toddler and have a play group and you could never get in there because it's always pickleball. And so multi-purpose is multi-conflict sometimes. And so having more space to program gives people more opportunity. And again, you know, looking to the consultants to find that sweet spot uh, as far as revenue projections when we get there. Thank you. Um, I'll just add um, in terms of the walking um, track around um, 16 <clears throat> laps is not bad. I trained for a marathon on an indoor track that required 16 laps to make a mile. That's not a big deal just to address Jim's um, comment. Um, but I do think we need a, the minimum of the um, the two courts, 14,000 square feet. Um, otherwise, if we can get an extra core, that'd be great. But if we need to cut costs, then then um, two is minimum. That's right. I'll just okay. bring up an idea that I think somebody, some others on the committee had a number of meetings ago, which is the gym is one area that we could target for future expansion as well. And so once we get into the site planning options, we can hold some space that the gym could expand, whether through full structured gym or even a field house type of setup, that if the demand is there, that there might be that potential to expand in the future. And something that's just something we'll keep in the list in the mix as we keep going with this. Okay, that's a really good point. I know we did talk about that a couple of different times, even when we were walking through some of the facilities that we went to, I think they had mentioned that they had the capability to go out in, the, in one direction or another. Um, okay, so Keith, I think the marching orders are maybe to come up with a three court design and modify the, the gross up and the ancillary spaces for that as well. Um, can we go back to the spreadsheet okay uh the elevator walking track would obviously be reflective of that too okay so let's talk about these other things could could somebody refresh my memory about what the the different facilities that we went to what they had for strength and training yeah, cardio sure. free weights yeah, it was really tough. At, let's start with Booth Bay because that's where we went first. That was cannibalized space. I think they had nine different areas along the floor. Um, it's down in the basement, though, right, Todd? That was we yeah. Went it was down in the basement. We went down, down and, and they and they had multi multi section. They had cardio room, free weight, uh, circuit, spin. Um, and again, my only comment with that facility was um, they're one of the only games in town because they're on the peninsula, so there's not like a lot of competition, and that's why I believe. Theirs was so big and so diverse in a lot of sections. Um, Wiscasset um, was probably only about 600 square feet, maybe 700 square feet. Uh, again, when that building was constructed, it was supposed to be a meeting room. And then when Main Yankee closed, they turned it into a fitness center to be able to charge more for memberships. Um, and so they actually cannibalized a hallway. That I think I mentioned on our tour. And then the Bath YMCA, if I remember, was um, uh, 2,500 square feet. And it was kind of that sweet spot where um, I think Keith might have mentioned that, you know, they were very they were very thoughtful. And Glenn and I, actually, well, it might have been Alex. They were very thoughtful on how many pieces they had. They didn't have 10, 10 treadmills. They had four and ellipticals, but they had a little bit of everything. Um, and the room was the room was busy. Um, and that was kind uh, of it was right behind those glass windows where we were yeah, standing was, right that picture and it yeah, was, there was yeah there was glass behind it on both sides you guys commented on the design um and again it uh it small just my opinion if you talk smaller than that then you start running into um uh not a lot of footprint as far as people, you saw that in cast. I don't remember who mentioned the comment, but you saw somebody gonna get off a piece of equipment. They turned sideways and walked to the next one. It was very uncomfortable. Okay, so I, I know this is one of the things we definitely talked about. We need to have it. If we're gonna have it, it needs to be big enough that it's actually usable, right? But we don't want to be in direct competition with, you know, the Foley's and the next next gens and the other ones that are in town. Um, but if you're buying a membership 
you're not necessarily going to just want to swim or shoot hoops or go to a, you know, Zumba class or play pickleball. You're probably going to at some point want to put your headphones in and go on a treadmill or do a little bit of cross weight training for, for strength and balance. Um, I think we need to have something. It's just a matter of finding that sweet spot. That's, that's kind of where I'm at on this. And, and, and that 2,500 square foot number may be the sweet spot. I don't, I don't know. What do people think about, about those things that I just said? If, if that's the square footage we saw in the last one, which was bath, correct? Yeah, square. Um, yeah, the one that was the, um, the best space. I, I think that is that is a sweet spot because it was just big enough to have all of the essential pieces of equipment without being um, crowded and without, you know, being so big that it would compete with any other um, local places. It's just going to be... Um, the place where, I mean, I think that's going to enhance the memberships. Um, you, we're going to get more members if we have that to offer, at least for the um, minimum equipment, because people are going to want to, you know, go to the pool and go to the gym at the same time. Um, I did also like how that um, space was right next to the track and you could see into the track and you could also see um, into, I think you could see into the pool area on the other yeah. side, right? Yeah, yeah, so it was just aesthetically pleasing and you wanted to go there. You know, it wasn't like the dark, dingy basement in the other facility. I agree. I think a lot of the parents that were there, I, I, we obviously couldn't have done it without asking them. I feel like they were there because their kids were swimming. Their kids were, you know, playing basketball or gymnastics. It gave them a chance to work out. And if parents are going to have to buy the membership for the pool, Maybe they don't want to spend the additional membership to go to a Foley's. They just want the family membership. So it doesn't have to be the high-end fitness place, but functional enough so they can be like, let's buy the family membership. So when my kids are doing this, I can do that. As it, you know, if anyone's had kids, the drop-off pickup goes someplace in the middle doesn't always work out when you have those hour or 90-minute programs. So having something functional enough there, if you're a hardcore weightlifter, obviously you're going to end up at a, one of the established facilities, I think. But I do think it has to be functional enough that you can buy that family membership and get something out of it without having to buy two if you don't want to. I think the other thing with a, 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 a having a center or whatever size, a fitness center in your facility, for a community, it's very inclusive. Because if you looked at the price, and when we get into the price analysis of what a membership could cost, when we get that feedback from our consultants, it's something that everybody can afford or there's you know you have scholarship committees you have different things where people can get access to health and wellness at a reasonable price where even though we don't want to compete and we don't want to cut there's certain demographics and i think um karen said at one of our first meetings is that she's not a gym goer but she may go to something like that that's less less uh, what's the word she less um intimidating you know to go and walk when everybody's there versus you know uh, spandex versus sweatpants, if you will, type of environment, you know, it's just different. So it's a more inclusive feel too. So I think that's important for a community to consider. Todd, we went on a Saturday too. Do you find like places have the indoor walking tracks with seniors coming out or they're doing like pool things during the day or more likely to even use like a, a weight section as well? Yeah. And that's when you, that's how you program it too, right? When we're programming a building, there's four times a day, there's before school, during school, after school and evening. And when you build your programming, you're trying to do that where, you know, you would have indoor walking and you don't put an age on it, but you know, at 11 o'clock, it's not tagging the people that are working. It's somebody that's home. It's an active adult, you know, then you're having a you know, lunch or a fitness class. You kind of piggyback those things together during those quadrants of programming. So yeah, absolutely. But again, on a Saturday, we saw a lot of parents, I would assume were parents to the same thing, walking around the track and you know, there are people that would rather take a mile around the track um, than hit a treadmill, you know. And so, again, it just those four quadrants of programming and you can kind of target those groups specifically. Uh, and then like late night, I'm sure when you're at Booth Bay at late night, seven o'clock, you've got people that are a little more intense. They probably program it for a little more running than leisurely walking because that's a different environment and straightaways and that sort of stuff. So those are all rules and schedules and kind of policy set in place to target the activity you're trying to operate. Okay. Um, I think, I think it's a similar result with the, with the 
the flex room yoga, you know, Taekwondo, Pilates, whatever it might be. Um, that's, that's a pretty small space. And, and I think, you know, if anything, we might want to inch up on, on both of those a little bit, but I think there was a good, you know, like Gwen said, I think those are kind of the, the spot we want to start the conversation at. Yeah, I was trying to remember, I was just trying to look at that aerobics stu uh, fitness studio. I think that's what the bath, Gwen and I stuck our head in that bath one. I think that was about 1100 square feet and it didn't, it didn't seem big and it didn't seem small. Um, again, high revenue, you know, low cost to build, high revenue potential, multi-purpose programming choices. I just wonder if you want to have more than just one of those in a in a uh, facility as big as this. Uh, the the room size seems right, but only having one. Uh, I guess I asked that question. Talking about the fitness studios. Yes, that um, yeah, sort of the uh, space. Yes. Um, would it be possible, um, like we were talking about with the gym space at a third gym potentially being an add on, could we, um, maybe have the consultants look at that in terms of, um, if we have to start with a scale back version and then uh, keep in mind, um, potential future addition. Yeah, I agree with Gwen. Uh, we've got a headwind as it is. Uh, we've got a real fight on our hands to get this passed. So uh, I like the idea that maybe we'd see how it worked with the one, but you're right, Jim, the a second one may be quite appropriate. Test of time. The other thing too as well, and again, depending on how people feel and they don't always like it, but with ample gym space, gymnasium space, mm -hmm. um, Wiscasa didn't have a fitness room, so they took they took that gym space and did fitness classes with your drop curtains, and so you could still do some of those classes in those gym space. Again, multiple floor, you know, the way the curtains are designed now, you know, three courts, three main curtains. You can cry, you could have six classes going on. So I think that um, some of those louder type classes, your zumbas, your aerobics, your type those type of things, you know, your fitness room is really for those quiet base, you know. Pilates, yoga, where you, you know, um, and sometimes those are better when people aren't, you don't have 60 people on a walking track staring at you either, you know, so um, I think that could be a definite add on consideration and for the consultant to look at revenue. But uh, I think, in my opinion, um, consider for potential revenue, but I would weigh the extra gym space as a priority um, if we had to choose. Okay, so what I'm hearing, I think I think we're generally in agreement on on the idea that two of these rooms might be worth it. Todd makes a really good point. If we have a third gym or two and a half gyms, then we might not need the second space, but we may want to think if we're going to engineer, value engineer out one of the gyms, we may want to add back in an extra one of these rooms, something like that as a, as a concession or a compromise. I think, now, I think there's going to also going to be an opportunity once the uh, designers start laying these out as far as utilization of space that uh, they may find that they've got a corner or a, uh, uh, an area here or there that uh, uh, to make the whole facility work. There may be some opportunities once the design gets a little further down the road to, to add these add some of these smaller rooms without adding to the footprint of the building. Yeah, agreed. Um, okay, so I guess what I'm hearing is we're going to leave these spaces as is and just kind of maybe put an asterisk uh, next to that 1,200 square foot yoga multipurpose room as that might be something we want to look at to be two depending on what we do with the gyms. Um, all right, let's pop back over to the community spaces because it's, I think, is a similar discussion, right? Um, get a, 
subdivided room furniture seminar. So I think kind of think this is the room off of that that learning kitchen. I think one or two of the places we went to had a learning kitchen. Um, and then there was a room kind of off that. This is kind of how I view that room is kind of falling into this community space where you could have, you know, a, a reception of some sort, some type of a birthday party, uh, you know, some, something along those lines. And then we did see, and one of them was definitely a commercial kitchen. The one in Wiscasset was very much not a commercial kitchen, but it still had kind of those traits that it could be used as a commercial kitchen space where you could have a caterer come in and have warming ovens and, um, you know, a nice a nice deep sink with a spray hose and things like that. So I, I think there is definitely programming space that would go along with, in particular, the second recreation pool um, and then maybe one of those one of those rooms that we were just talking about that could be used for a, a birthday party, you know, Taekwondo class or something like that, and then have cake and ice cream and pizza in, in another space. So these are kind of spaces I think that would be very much able to be packaged in a in a in a marketing deal for some type of, a, of an activity. So I, th I think that they would be used readily. Um and I and I and I don't know about bang for the buck. I don't know if Brad or or, or Keith could talk about that. Uh, you know, are, are these spaces that are more expensive to build than some of the other spaces that we've talked about that would be kind of multi-purpose spaces? I think they can trend towards the more expensive space depending on the types of activities you want to be able to host in there and the level of finish that you're going to provide. And that might be something we talk a little bit more with our consultants about in terms of the uh, the market that would be in Scarborough for these types of facilities. But I think you can, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of the amount that you would spend on finishes in those spaces. So we'd want to, you know, really try to find that right balance between providing just enough level of finish and flexibility to the space and the underlying infrastructure to make it useful and attractive in terms of revenue standpoint without breaking the budget in terms of a capital cost. Let me, let me, sorry, Patrick, go ahead. I was just going to say, Keith, are these square footage numbers representative of kind of what we saw in our, in our tours for these types of spaces? Um, I was able to grab a couple of those square footages. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, the, what they called the senior center in Wiscasso was about 1480 square feet. Um, and then let's see if I have some of the other ones. Um, was that the room that they were just finishing a karate class in? Yeah. And it had, the, that was the long galley kitchen, you know, it had commercial yeah. items, but it was very narrow. Yeah, yeah. That's just under 15. Uh, for those that didn't join us town, uh, council chambers is just over 1500 square feet. Just both chambers, to, to both combined. chambers combined is just over. It's like 870 and seven something. It's, um, just over that number. So yeah. for perspective, perspective. Yeah. Keith, what about the kitchen space? Um, the kitchen at Booth Bay, um, just very roughly, I think it was like 300 to 400 square feet, just counting ceiling tiles. Uh, I don't have a good plan of it. Um, so we were looking at something a little, a little smaller than that. Um, at least what's, what's in there on the screen now. And then Wiscasset, um let's see that's probably like seven feet wide by uh 30 or so feet long yeah. um yeah it was probably like 240 maybe yeah okay so so those, those are tight spaces the, the the numbers here i think those are fairly tight spaces yeah i don't think they're too big they probably might be on the small side the only thing i was going to say and this is where i'd leave it in keith and brett's you know some of their designs that we've looked at um They've really complemented the joint space with the use of like glass garage doors and you've opened up into a meeting room. So the space felt bigger, you know, than it actually is. Um, but you're, you know, protecting your catering kitchen cooking area. Yet instead of having a counter on one side, you know, it's opened into other areas. And so um, I think there's a way to make those rooms feel bigger if you need to. Um, but again, depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. Other thoughts on these spaces? Yeah, I have a, I, my biggest question really is the 
true need for the multi-purpose meeting rooms and multi-generational game rooms. Um, I could be convinced if there's um, some way to make those somewhat budget neutral. I think we do need the child watch area for the people who are uh, members and working out. Um, but otherwise, um, I think some of those other meeting spaces are already potentially met in the community. So I, I think I would um, want to see the cost of that um, and the potential revenue. On the other hand, um, the question for you, Todd, is um, do any of, of these rooms or does any of this space take the place of anything that we're already paying for, like the, um, what's the name, the, the facility on um, Payne Road? Hub. Yeah, the hub. Yeah, I mean, if we were, yeah, so two two answers to two questions if I heard. Um, if we if this were to come to fruition, we would not be leasing the hub. Um, that would be a revenue offset to reduce on one side and share the share that potential offset somewhere else. So um and then um the other part of the question is is just kind of that need. Um when we spoke with the Patrick and chime in and Bill, when we we chatted with the library trustees and when we see, you know, staff around. Uh, I'm sorry, space around town, uh, meeting space is, is tougher than you would think as far as scheduling. Um, and a lot of it becomes to uh, having staff in a space. You know, we may have a space, but nobody's there to open or close it uh, or clean it. Um, and and that's the nice thing about a, a, a center. You, you're having custodians open and custodians close and somebody at the desk. So, you know, you have programming capabilities or rental capabilities um, uh, throughout uh, the time that you're operating. So there is the potential for revenue and um, you know, we could get that data to see kind of where that sweet spot is. But yes, um, too much, too little. I think that's for a conversation once we see what that revenue potential is. I will say though, uh, and again, it's an area to, to discuss and reduce if that's what it comes down to. Um, that multi-generational game area was pretty high on the kids list as far as that user group and as a facility manager nice to say go to the room get out of the hallway go to the room you know um, a place to disperse when you're transitioning uh, depending on that final design but again it is a cost that has to be considered or be removed so just my two cents Todd, would that something like that be uh, a room that only members would have access to or are we talking about this being just a place where the kids go and hang out like the library where there's no fees to be I, there i think it depends on the model of the once you get into that membership structure and then also if it's open to anybody then it's on one side again if you if you want to say a quote-unquote paywall because it'll still need to be supervised you know um, and so I think that just depends on, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. If that makes sense. The library, uh, the, the library's experience is that there's a high demand for uh, rentable space. So uh, that was an important part of our business plan. I expect it'll uh, lap over into the community center. Uh, for a number of years, I've, I've heard in, in Scarborough talk about the need for a senior citizen facility. Now, I don't I don't see anything. I see multi-purpose. You know, I'm not sure. And maybe seniors is not the word, but I'm I am one so I can use that. But uh, having a room or a facility that's a little quieter, I'm not sharing it with 12 year olds or 14 year olds. Uh, a place that I could go with my friends, maybe have a little card game, uh, just uh, lounge isn't the right word, but uh, something that's a little bit more appropriate for those of us. So I, we've talked about this a little bit. Um, I don't think we can be everything for everybody. And I don't think we should necessarily try. I mean, we, obviously that's not, let me take that back. We should try to do, to provide as many possible options for as many people as possible. However, we don't want to try to be a 
competition swimming pool facility um, with a huge focus on that, a, a, a be all end all senior center, a daycare facility, an after school care facility. We're not going to be all of those things. And we would give a 200,000 square foot building if we wanted to try, to try to be all those things. What we want to try to do is to appeal to as many people as possible in the community and get support for this on a, you know, a certain budgetary with certain budgetary constraints. So we, we, I don't think we can have a full blown senior center. And I don't think, I think seniors might actually take it. And I don't know, there's a better phrase. People say active adults. Is that what it is? Uh, uh, there's a, there's a probably a pendulum that would swing the other way if we tried to have or tried to sell it as solving that issue in town and it and it fell short or woefully short, that would be probably way more worse than trying to just say, this is what we have. If if you would use it as an active adult, great. But this is this is not going to be solving the senior center question in town that has been kind of bandied about, like people have said for many years. Well, I, two, I can two wait. things came up um, during the hub um, conversations. One was that during the day when the kids are in school right. is when the active adults would be using that space more often as their own, um, number one. And number two, I know that it came up from both sides that it would be great to have some intergenerational activities as well and opportunities. So it it, it didn't seem to make sense after my conversations that it would um, be make sense to have space that was um, solely for active adults in a separate space only for um, kids, but rather space that's shared at different times of the day and in an effort to combine the two. Um, as, as the liaison for a number of years to the seniors uh, in town, um, from a town council point of view, yeah, there was some movement a few years ago, oh, we need our own separate center, but I absolutely agree that that, that uh, multi-generational room could be used as a so-called senior area or center during the day. And Todd, you can speak to this better than I can because I'm not at the hub during the day because I work. Um, but um, I, my assumption, and I should never assume, is that the seniors are there like midday. Am I going to say like 10 in the morning to 2? Yeah, they're, depending on the day of the week, they're there anywhere from 9 to, to 2, depending on the okay. day. I yeah. think Jim's point's well well stated in the sense of maybe it's not a des designated space because I think that um, and this would be a, a, a not a challenge for Keith and for for Brett but a consideration when they're doing their building design and this is kind of way Wiscasa did it is that you know you've got that kind of large multi-purpose room and depending on the furnishings and the fit out if that's close to the entrance of the building so it's not a long walk. Uh, and you probably want to do that anyways for general public events. Um, you know, we had, you could see in Wiscasa that one part of that room had a laminate floor, which was more suited better to having coffee and, and food. And the other half of that room was rug where it was just quieter and it felt better. And so I think that, you know, if you had like this multi-purpose room, when you're talking about breaking those out into three units, if one of those headrooms was close enough to, you know, whether there's a game room or not, or the lobby, um, that room could be designed with storage to be able to accommodate what I think Jim was trying to accomplish to give a quiet space on a regular schedule where you knew room A, B, and C, and room A every day from nine to noon was scheduled for senior activities and the staff set up card tables. And it was, you know, okay. you could have that kind of set up in one of those spaces as long as that it's a, a, a primary and a priority when you're talking about schedule and design as far as how you use it, the intent could be made versus having a dedicated space. But I do appreciate Jim's comments because I think that's a very valuable. Oh, uh, well, I do too. I mean, I'm a senior myself or elder, I like to call myself, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> the um, I think the more flexibility we have in the various rooms that we build, no matter what they are, the more helpful it will be. And particularly in selling it to the to the community, um, 
Todd, just, and I should know the answer to this. How many seniors, elders, seniors, people over the age of whatever, um, do we have on a daily basis, would you say, on average, using the hub? Uh, I mean, since we've gone to this side of town, we're anywhere from 30 to 50 on a given day. Okay, all right. You know, um, you know when we were on the Route 1 side of town, you know, we, were, we had some higher numbers. Uh, yeah. just for sheer location and ease of access yeah. um, again with a community center you're bringing in all kinds of people right that don't know that our things are going on or i may come like jim said jim and i are going to meet for a cup of coffee before we play pickleball you know what i mean and having that just quiet transitional space so yeah uh, i think that's important too. Okay. and todd what are those people doing when they're there uh they're they're having coffee they're playing games um doing puzzles. Uh, there's some different groups, Marjan, Bridge, you know, they've got, there might be three or four little niche game groups going on. Uh, there's some people who just come sit and be social. They don't even play. You know, they just exactly. come to get a cup of coffee and book exchange or a puzzle exchange. It, it's just, it's a social piece for yeah. a lot of folks. Yeah. And it's safe. So they know they can just go and, 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 and I think that's important. I would agree. I'll just jump in here, which is says say a couple of things. One, um, I think the conversation has been great and it is, I want to make sure we're distinguishing between the programming, which is the all of the activities and the programs that the community center is going to run in these spaces and what we as architects call the program, which is really just focused on the spaces themselves and making sure that we're allocating enough space in this first draft for the types of activities that we've all been talking about. And I think we're on the right track here. And the second thing I'll say is just remind you again of things that you all is, have said as a committee before, which is these community spaces are really what distinguishes this building as a community center versus a pure recreation center. All of the spaces that we've been talking about up to now in terms of the sports and the aqu aquatics, that's recreation center. And if you want to reach a broader audience, I think you do need to fold in some of these community room spaces so that you have that diversity of potential activities that happen in the building. Yeah, well said. Okay, so we have three multi-purpose rooms, flexible spaces, dividers. We have three sets of storage tables, uh, storage and tables and chairs for those spaces. We have two, a small and medium conference room. We have a catering kitchen, we'll call it. So not a full commercial kitchen, not a learning kitchen. Um, so this would not be like that one that we saw in Brunswick. Was that right? Uh, uh, that, um, booth, Bay. booth Bay. Booth Bay, sorry, Booth Bay. Yep. Uh, bath and Booth Bay. Um, so, and then the Child Watch, which is pretty tiny. Um, and then the multi generational room, one of those, which 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 actually I was surprised that was on a lot of the different um, charrettes that we had. People talked about game room, you know, e esports that kind of thing. I mean, that's maybe mixed in here somewhere, but you know, I think I think Brett's comment about this is really what makes it a community center. Um, I think that's really important. So my question, I guess, then is is this enough? Todd, I actually had that question. If if the plan were to move forward this, they were to give up the hub. I know you have some spaces that are obviously replicated, but does would these spaces give you enough space to do the hub for what you use it for? Or is that more of a plan of no, that will just stay, that's going to stay in the schools? Like what's the, just like, I, I don't know exactly how you program it. I've been in the space. I've seen the, got my passport there. I knew you had the little gym in the back, but like, does this give you what you need to also have community doings and how's that group of kids or not yeah no i think um and again it's it's uh square footage for each space is for me it's waiting to see how they're all connected and how they you know how they feel if you've got you know a room and a king's and how they all lay out makes the space seem bigger i think there will be some discussions when you start to see a floor plan or whatever at that point like at that point is it really big enough to be able to do what we need to do i think this is a great starting point i think i would flag um uh, the uh, catering kitchen uh, as a kind of look at down the road because I know that we saw a lot of kind of conversation. I, I know people like the um, 
the booth bay one was you know it was you know only a couple hundred square feet more but maybe you take a hundred square feet off of the game room and put it over there you know what i mean you can shape that square footage when you get there once we see kind of what some of those those costs perspective but you know everything we've talked about um we can duplicate what we're doing at the hub uh and offer in multiple times and sections because you're always going to have staff there which is volume wise repetitive which is nice Okay, so is there a consensus that this is this is where we want to start with for these spaces, these community spaces? It's good. Okay. Um, I'd like to shift back now to the beginning. <laughs> I, I welcome you guys. Sorry, I'm disagreeing with my uh, my logic here, but um, the support spaces I think are boring. So I'd rather talk about the stuff that's a little more interesting. So the the entry lobby. We saw where how they had to reconfigure the one in Wiscasset to make it so they didn't have the wind blowing across the desk and the coming in the front door. We saw that they had kind of choke points a little bit here and there and some other spaces. And and I think we've all been to community centers or Ys and things like that outside from the ones that we went to look at that have either the 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 college kind of this is the desk where you check in and it's very like I don't want to say regimented, but it's 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 a checkpoint, right? It's not a transactional. It, it's transactional. Thank you. Perfect. Um, thanks, Dennis. It's transactional. It's not necessarily welcoming or congenial, right? Or collegiate, let's say. Um, and other ones that you've been in, it's it's like walking into the lobby of a hotel almost. You know what I mean? Where it's there's comfortable seating. It's it's easy to navigate. If there aren't necessarily choke points where they might have a lot of traffic coming and going, where there's a meet being released or a school bus being dropped off to go to something or another. Um, there's definitely, you know, the desk over there that you would need to check in to get to the to the part where you'd have to have a membership to pay to get into. But if you're just going for a meeting or you're going to pay for your um, community services, you know, youth soccer fee for the fall, you know, it's clear that you need to go there for that. Um, but it's it's more open. A thousand square feet strikes me as being more, maybe not necessarily, but seems to be a little bit more prone to choke points in that transactional type of lobby. Ether, Brett, do you have a comment there just cause as far as a point of reference when you were putting this together? Yeah, I'll let Keith kind of think about if there was a comp in the uh, facilities that you all visited, but Patrick, I think you're right. It's probably a little more on the streamlined end of things, just with an eye towards keeping the program uh, pretty tight. But I think your comments about it wanting to feel open and inviting and welcoming and comfortable for everybody who visits are are really well received. And maybe we want to bump that square footage up modestly. I don't think it takes, we're not talking about tripling the size of the lobby to get that feeling it might be a kind of incremental growth of 500 square feet that in the in the grand context of the um, size of the facility we're talking about is not a lot and as as the building becomes you know moves from spreadsheet to real design those are the types of spaces that can come naturally without even actually growing the program but just as we were talking about earlier that there might be nooks and crannies depending on different uh, characteristics of the site that that would come naturally and not really add a, a significant cost to the project overall. And I think some people might make the argument that there's no revenue generated from these types of spaces necessarily, but I think that overall atmosphere sets the tone for what somebody might be willing to pay for or to re, re up if they try it out and they, and they don't like it because they have, gotten stuck behind that school bus being dropped off or whatever, you know what I mean? So I think directly, no, probably no revenue being generated from any of these spaces unless we're going to rent out, you know, uh, a meeting room or something like that that might be in this, but it's it kind of just sets the tone for the overall facility. It's a first impression. This is also, to me, a big retention factor. I know in my previous in Wiscasset, there was a lot of frustration and angst when you dumped out like you guys saw on a Saturday and there was 200 people leave in the gym into that little lobby. Um, 
where's my kid? What's going on? You can't hear at the front desk. So yeah, the atmosphere and the feel when you're coming in, but um, everyday function is a huge retention as well, just how it operates. Assuming that cafe space is connected to that lobby, that adds some square footage there. Is that how um, that was em envisioned? Uh, yeah, that that's the idea. Um, you know, I think that's like, it, you know, a small counter, or kind of two two counters, a front and back counter, and then a little bit of associated seating. Again, just for square footage, envision walking into town council chambers. That's just under sixteen hundred square feet, just over fifteen and under sixteen. That's that total square footage there. So that's what you, if you walked into the middle of council chambers, that's kind of the space you're talking about, just for a visual for folks. When people come in, Todd, for like a swim meet or something like that, I mean, do they do they just do they walk right back there if they check? Like, you know, do parents get to go back that you don't need a membership? You know, do they have to pay to get in like they do at some of the high school games? Like, what does that look like in terms of needing some of these spaces or separate entrances? Yeah, I think it depends on the, the design and how traffic flows. Um, you know, you always want to make sure that your members and your guests have access to your registration desk. So. I'm coming to swim, I can check in uh, or I can go pay. Um, and then depending how you transition and where you're going, you may put up a temporary, you may put up a table to say, hey, people entering the basketball tournament are gonna check in here. Um, or you, everybody's at the front desk, depending on how big or how many workstations you have. It really depends on that, that design. Um, and they might charge admission to that. So if you rented the gym out or you had a tournament, they might yeah. go up there and pay five bucks to get in. Yep. But you get some wristband to walk around and do whatever and go to the cafe, but they have to go that way type of thing. Yeah, you've got those control points, you know, I mean, you got that welcoming place, but then you've got control points to get to from point A to point B. Um, so that's just more in design than needing more space it's in the lobby, but having to be yeah. big enough to be able to point in the different areas. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Just curious, because that plays into Patrick's thing about being big enough to handle those. If those, I've never been to a swim meet, so if those are something that are going to happen where hundreds of people are popping in and you want to keep that flow, that inviting, bigger, easy to point directional space might be a really big selling point to keeping your community engaged and focused and the functionality of renting out or whatever it is, one of those areas for a big competition. Well, you saw Wiscasset dumping one gym. Yeah. Imagine if you had three. And you can't necessarily charge your parents to drop their kid off at practice or go watch. They no. just get to go if because they're paying for the programs. Right. You can try. We might have to, uh, revenue model one, we'll see. <laughs> I like the idea of the concession space. The uh, Whisk Acid had just that small area right there, and that was the only place I could get a cup of coffee for the whole morning. So it was it was nice just to have, that's all it had was coffee and snacks and whatever. So I I, I think it's, it's a good idea to have one. Anyone's been to the point, they have a really, they, it's not in use usually at night, but they have a really nice, coffee area with their lounge sitting you walk in there's the you know there's their kind of their i don't know what it's turf field right in front of you the gyms to the right and they have all this sitting space and then they have a little cafe that's open on the weekends over in south portland okay so i think you got you got the feedback you need on that i think we've got a couple of little tweaks you guys might want to look at on those spaces there um and then I want to be mindful of our time. I don't know. I, I know we have a pretty big item on the agenda still to set future meeting dates because this is the last meeting I think we have actually scheduled right now. And that's going to take a minute or two. So the support spaces and then the office spaces for SCS. Um, I, Todd, I'm assuming if, I, I, I'm I'm fine with you giving them feedback on on what you think makes sense for the SCS uh, storage spaces and meeting rooms and all that stuff. Um, yeah, I, I would I would say right now, again, it, just in my experience, I would leave the support spaces up to them based on some of the other choices you make. You know, I mean, again, three gyms, more pools means more custodial space, you know, maybe more closets, that sort of stuff. So I think I, I think I would leave that to them to kind of that support space to meet the scope and size of the facility you're talking about. I used in Wiscasset one custodial closet and it was an absolute nightmare that had a, a wet sink and a dry mop sink to go get stuff and you lug that all over the building. Um, so I think it just depends on the size. 
I think regarding the uh, community center staff stuff, uh, again, I think that number is, as of right now, is is prudent. I think it comes down to the design and what it, you know, what it looks like and feels like. You know, if it's a small space and you choke behind a cement wall, it doesn't feel as big as if you're looking through a glass window. So I think that, uh, um, and then obviously when they get to the operational plan, what does that mean for more staff? You know, as far as especially on the, I mean, we know where there's going to be aquatic staff because that's the, we don't have that now, but that usually lands in the pool area. So I think this is an adequate amount of space to start with. Yeah, that's kind of where I was thinking is this stuff would be kind of formulaic based on everything else that we've given them for feedback. Correct. So um, I'll I'll, uh, I'll assume nobody's raising their hand because we have other things to talk about in this quarter to nine or 10 to nine. Um, and I haven't shoveled yet tonight. So I'm going to have to get this get this moving, right? So can we go back to the agenda? Any, any, other, any other strong feedback one way or the other about this program list? Okay, good. So the next item on the agenda, item five, is public uh, comment, Patrick. Do we have anybody in the public who would like to unmute and speak their piece? I don't see any movement. We got two people. I don't see any hands at this point. No. If you think of something in the next uh, minute or two, go ahead and unmute, but we'll move on just to save time here. Um, What's the next, next there? Item six is the next agenda item, which is really going back to that schedule that Keith put together, which is uh, going from every two weeks to every three weeks, just because of the amount of work and being able to get information out like we did this time, at least a week ahead of time for you guys to be able to review. So, uh, Keith, you had that on there, your initial slide. Um, while he's pulling that up, I will say... Um, and, and uh, Jean Marie was going to kind of fish this out with council. You do you do see our charge timeline, and they, she was going to double check this with council. Um, you know, instead of having something done in May based on three weeks and our December schedule that got pushed, getting something more in the middle of July. So it, you know, one it would expand your time frame a little bit by uh, a month and a half. Um, it does push meetings out every three weeks versus two to be able to get this work accomplished. Um, and unless council decides to change something, this does hit budget benchmarks as far as getting preliminary stuff in the budget. If they so choose to put something in the CIP this year or next, it's in with all their windows of discussion. And then having that final report due in July still is allow, allows council the option to put something in a, in a this year ballot. And if they choose to push it into next year, you've got a document that's that's shovel ready to go, depending on everything else that's going on. So this still allows you to um, have a deliverable for them during their their decision making process, if you will. Yeah, okay. and if I, and if I could add to that, I have not talked to council because we haven't met. Um, but this, I I'm going to be blunt with you. I'm going to be honest with you. I this I. School comes first right now, um, as far as most of the council is concerned. Um, so I, I, I am very pretty ninety five percent sure this isn't going to any ballot in November. Um, but I've seen stranger things happen in this world. But you guys have done such an awesome job, and it's such a talented group of people that we want to keep, you know, let's keep moving forward with this. If nothing else, as Todd mentioned, you know, at least making it, putting a placeholder for it in there so that we know what we're talking about for for uh, financial figures. Um, and um, yeah, <laughs> that's why I say I'm in the middle of the maelstrom here as far as, you know, what are we going to do and and what's what's important for the community. So I just I just want to be honest with you guys that that I I really sincerely doubt this is going to go anywhere for a November ballot, um, but that doesn't mean we can't keep moving forward and come up with a really good package. Um, so does that sound right, Todd? From what we discussed the other day. Yeah, and and I want to be fair to this committee. I, I thoroughly disagreed with with Jean Marie and 
and yes, some people you did. <laughs> yes, vividly you did. disagreed with people in the room. Um, but I, I get I have superiors. Um, because my thing for this group is that um everybody keeps saying this is a wish. I think this is a strong desire, it's been noted. And if this is ready to go in this timeline and an opportunity provides itself, somebody mm. gives a piece of land, we decide then this needs to be ready to go. Um, because again, I, I, right. some of those other timelines are still out and about. And, uh, right. um, I think there's still opportunity here. Um, I will respectfully, uh, understand where Jean Marie is coming from, but, um, I, I think there's other opportunities too. And there's, and I think, you know, talking to some folks too, I think there's some other funding methods we can look at. Um, well, I was, I was just going to bring that up because while we were talking, I don't know if you noticed, uh, Dennis, me and put up a chat uh, on the Auburn Police Athletic League, whatever it is, their community yeah. center, so to speak. doesn't so, have a pool, though, does it, Dennis? No, no, I meant to but share anyway, that. that I forgot said, to hit return to put it in the chat. I was going to type it in and say, hey, if you didn't see this announcement today, but there's two articles there. Auburn yeah. just took their Police Athletic League. They're putting a new $9 million. It looks like it's more of a field house yes. gym with some community right. space. But they, right. they just went through this and they're using some federal funds they got and things like that for about more than half right. of that's being covered through federal right. and town um, put up. So just something I wanted to share as we've been, we you know, we toured all the places. Just take right. a click in the, uh, the chart. Right. But my point and why I wanted to bring it up was funding. Are there other funding sources that we can bring in? Um, mm -hmm. I know this police athletic league, they talked about ARPA money, which was part of the COVID monies that they're using that which we don't have, I don't believe. I should be, I'm not on finance, so I'm I'm talking you know, out of school here, but, um, but are there other opportunities to seek funding, you know, federal, state, I don't there, know what's out there. Todd's the expert on yeah, that. There there's is a, opportunities that we could look at for sure. Right. Yeah, I think there's a lot of options and the key here is that none of them will be viable if we don't have a file num final number right. of business plan. Yeah, right. That's exactly. The key. That's exactly. the key here. And if it's an opportunity thinking out of the box is what we have to do. Correct. Yes, I agree. Yeah. So, and I, and I, and I, you know, I didn't want to be sound like Debbie Downer because that's not, if, if it were, if I had a magic wand, I'd be like, yeah, let's put them all out there. Let's find funding for all of them. Let's get them passed. Um, Cause they're neat. Everything's, I mean, this is crazy for a town this size, a municipality this size, that we don't have a community center and that we argue about schools of all the foolish things, but whatever. Um, that's the political reality. And I have to deal, I deal in that world. So um, anyway, I want to see this be successful. So, you know, keep, let's keep doing the good work that you guys are doing. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, the charge to the committee was supposed to be over sometime in, I don't know what, April, I think, early May, yeah. maybe. Um, early so May, yeah. It sounds like we're probably going to be extending out a little bit beyond that just to have yeah. ourselves have, have enough time to have yeah. the consultants vet the different pieces and go back and forth with us. Yeah. Um, so, so that's what we're looking at. I, I, I'm, I'm glad that, that the, you know, quote unquote pause that we had uh, coming out of the school referendum um, has, you know, been come and gone and we're able to continue on this this path that we're going down um, because I think it is important work for all the reasons that people have stated. So so let's let's press on with that so that the thought is to do every three weeks, Todd, is that what we're looking at? Yeah, that's kind of what we looked at. Uh, one, to be able to get public information out because we're now getting to the point where uh, it's just not education on our part. It's kind of what the process is with UTL. But now there'll be coming things to say, okay, here's square footage, here's the cost. This is where the public really needs to start getting yeah. engaged yeah. to help you shape your opinions and really what's ultimately valuable because a, a resident, until they know what it costs on their taxes and what it might cost them monthly to join us, right. they can't say yes or no. And so we're getting to that point now where they can really feel it, touch it, see it, and make educational decisions, excuse me, about that program. So yeah, three weeks, we'll let UTL do the work and let us get out the information so packets are out 
in ahead of time for you guys to see so we can have fruitful discussions when we meet. We're not okay. seeing it for the first time. Were we so I see some switch... placeholder. Sorry, go ahead. Were we going to switch the day of the week after January? I know we had talked about that a little bit. What day of the week? That we were going to be meeting. Right. What day of the week would you raise well, your preference? I I just remember at the beginning of the year, we were going to revisit that in January, changing it from Thursday, or is it a preference to keep it on Thursdays, or what are we thinking? I'll just make the only request I have. I know as we push this out, which I'm fine with doing, pretty like starting in April, I have to work at night at Sea Dogs Games every other week. So as long as maybe we've got a little flexibility to bounce it around, I just can't do the meetings when the team's home because I have to work that night. But every other week or every two or three weeks, I'm not, I don't have to do that. Day of the week doesn't matter unless we went to Monday where we never have games. But I know that's not a very popular meeting date, even for yeah. me. Mondays are not great, but. Yeah, I can't do Wednesdays, but other than that, I can be flexible. Yeah, I can't. I most, I've got two Wednesday, one, two, three Wednesdays a month already booked between town council meetings on Wednesdays and ordinance committee, so. Tuesdays and Fridays are bad for me, so. Like uh, we're here. Maybe, maybe Monday's looking better. <laughs> I don't know. Mondays work for me. So <laughs> That's the Monday we don't have games, so. Yeah. Um, Mondays, Mondays are generally okay. Me. Mondays are generally okay for me, too. Did anybody have, anybody have hard stops on Mondays? Let's well, check with Brett and Keith. I mean, because they have to. What's your Mondays? <laughs> well, I think we'll make it work. And My it's only every preference would be Thursdays, but yeah, we had kind of built this around Thursday. I thought the consensus was it was Thursdays, oh. but this was a, an outlier. But flexibility. So Mondays and Thursdays are actually okay for me, generally speaking. But did anybody say Thursdays are bad? No. I didn't hear that. I heard Wednesdays are bad and Tuesdays might be bad. And I, I can do pretty well on Thursdays too because there's some of them that we have day games sort of work out. If it does want to give you. So do we just right. stay here on Thursday, Patrick, and know we have Mondays if we really need. Here's the key. What I would ask, and I, I'm, I'm spitballing here. If we stay on Thursdays and we really have a pinch point, I would love to see, you know, when we send out agendas, a quick reply back to me, hey, I'll be there, not be there, so we can make sure we have forums. And yeah. if we see a real pinch point date, then I can loop back to you, Patrick, and say, okay, what's Monday look like of that week, you know, as we get closer? Yeah, uh, okay. That's up to the community to share with us where they're jammed up, too. So we're looking at the first the first full week of February. Is that the next meeting date? Yeah, it'll be the 8th. I think that's what's on. Uh, yeah, February 8th is the next meeting on key schedule here if we stay perfect i have a conflict that day already <laughs> right after that. beautiful i'm free on that monday though actually monday is the only day i'm not booked up that week but i don't need to be there i mean i i can catch up afterwards or i can join in i'm just uh tied up until probably eight o'clock i'll leave this up to you guys I'm going to be away on the 8th, but I am available on Monday the 5th. Okay, so that's that's two out of five that can't that have a conflict on the 8th. So can we try to do the 5th for that first one? 5th works for me. Yeah, it's okay. All right, so, so the 5th. Tom, will you just update? So right now I think we're on the opposite Thursdays. Will you send out a new? Yeah. Like I have um, them already blocked off. Yep. Okay. Yeah, no, we'll send you a new schedule. Okay. So you're talking so about not 2-8, two, 2-5. Two, so Mon Monday the 5th, Monday, February 5th, and then we go to the 29th is to go back to Thursdays. But every third. Every I'm third sorry. Thursday, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it goes the 29th huh? of February, and then you're March 21st. You got to meet on leap year day, don't you? I mean, I was going to say of, leap geez. day. <laughs> uh 29th i'm i'm golden february 29th february 29th thursday the 29th yep and then it's march 21st it's a thursday it's 21st 
That's also good for me. Well, we're hitting, you're missing all kinds of other stuff I have yeah. on my calendar, which is perfect. And then April 11th is when they're proposing um, site uh, cost kind of revenue open house to be able to share. That's kind of that first big public share as far as seeing stuff would be April 11th, which is a Thursday. That works for me. That's a non game day week. Yep. That works for me too. And then you're into regularly scheduled meetings on April 25th. That's only two weeks though, right? Are we doing three or are we going two? Uh, that one is, yeah, because there's a public meeting, uh, the input meeting in between. So there's two between that one. And then it goes to May 16th. 25th of April is yep. fine for me. 16th of May. May. Is that a return flight? Uh, it is. I am going to be out of the country that day. Will you send these out? Yeah, I'll send these out um, because, again, it's everybody's schedule may change a little bit that far out, yeah. too. Yeah. Um, and then the next one would be June 6th. So just to let you know, the 16th of May, I cannot do if there's an alternate date that might work for people. Do you want to go to the Monday that week? Yeah, why, that, why don't we work, work Patrick? it? Yeah. Monday the 13th is fine for me, May 13th. Oh. I can do that. So I'll confirm with Keith and Brett, and we're cha just changing two dates to Mondays of the same week, which would be uh, the 5th instead of February 5th, and then uh, May 13th. And you said June 6th for the last one? June 6th. That's, that's a day game for the Sea Dogs. So you somehow missed three months of Sea Dogs game. So hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Is, they're delivering. And then I see July 18th on there too. Yeah, that's when they deliver their final report. So that would be a final. I assume that's to to council potentially. I'll confirm that. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. I think we were thinking that would be like a final draft, um, which you know could be potentially circulated, but then like the final deliverable would 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 maybe extend to August. That's kind gotcha. of what we're thinking. Yeah. Okay. So final. so we got February 5th and May 13th are the only two Mondays. Everything else is on that Thursday schedule as printed on here. Right. Is that what have we got? You're going to send it all out anyway. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. I'll confirm with these guys tomorrow and then we can look at that. Are, are we any... going to do one in late June as well, Patrick? I'm sorry. Just after June 6th, between that, between the July one, or is that off? That's sorry. off. I think okay. it's off. that's off. Yeah. That's off. Perfect. Yeah. That gives them time to do their report or draft report, excuse me, the draft report. Okay. Uh, I don't have the agenda right in front of me. Is there anything yeah. else we have? Nope, that's that's it. And then, again, they've been great about sending the agenda items kind of with their task list. So we'll get those out to you, Patrick, ahead of time and uh, for approval like we did, and then go from there. All right. Uh, Todd, Perfect. I was going to ask, are you, well, do you have a list that you could send us that we might even go just on our own to check out of other local, not as far away, but just like, you know, what, what would be good comparables that we're looking at just to get more eyes on? I just pop into Southport and look around or something like that. Like I just don't know what the best ones are. Yeah, they might fit I'll, in like I'll, what um, we have. I'll look uh, like a half an hour. I mean, what you saw is probably diverse. You have to get into Bangor to get, you know, into the um, Alphon centers at the YMCA in Waterville. That's a, probably a, a bigger center with multiple courts, the type of thing you're looking at going that direction, you know, um, Bates Field House. I mean, Bates, yeah, yeah, Bates, Colby, those are big facilities. Um, everything else is probably south into Mass or New Hampshire. Uh, okay. But I can get you a list of things and kind of put a comparable, like, hey. But you could look at like the Freeport Y. That's not far away. And that's got a, a probably a similarly sized weight room and, and cardio room to what we're going to have. And they have a pool there also. Yeah. What I can try to do is now that you guys have sent them with these amenity lists. I can try to try to find comparable amenities, maybe like go to the Freeport Y to see a six lane pool or a 25 square foot weight room. I can try to delve that out a little bit. Um, so depending on what you want to look at, you can go see what that looks like. Um, but those are all those are Freeport. It's probably similar to Wiscasset size. Yeah. Augusta Y is similar to Wiscasset size. Um, but I can try to find amenities, maybe. There's the Bitterford Y too. I mean, there's 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 a bunch within a half hour, forty five minutes that you could get yeah. to that are not exactly what we're talking about doing, but would give you some like 
certain programs comparable sizes. That's, that's I guess I'm looking at. We kind of gave a really good wish list. So if we knew a 2,500 square foot weight facility is going to be this with this, just see some different things. So when we get into like looking at actual designs, it's like, oh man, I really saw this great thing here. And I just don't think I've been to one. I've been to three or four, but not enough of them. Yep. That it's probably worth me just driving around and taking a look around a couple of my own, you know? Yeah. Yep. Good just idea. to be more knowledgeable. Yep. And pull that together. And again, if there's if there's interest down the road in the spring to do another tour south into those Massachusetts ones that I mentioned, happy to do that too. So okay. Very good. Thank you, everybody. I did a terrible job chairing this meeting. We're two hours and seven minutes. So I apologize for slacking on that for you guys. We'll do better next one. And uh, everybody travel That's safe and over. snow here tonight and uh, take care. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.